As the nation's leading special collections library documenting the history of women and gender in America, Schlesinger preserves and makes accessible the papers of women ranging from Amelia Earhart to Susan B. Anthony to Dr. Mildred Jefferson to Harriet Beecher Stowe, as well as the records of institutions working in just about every facet of every wave of the women's movement and much else besides. We hold more than 3,500 manuscript collections stretching across approximately 16,000 linear feet, which is more than enough to fill three vaults, the largest of which is housed, housed right here below us in the sub-basement of what used to be the Radcliffe Gymnasium, towering more than 20 feet from the bottom of the college's former swimming pool. It's called the pool vault. As a woman's history archive, Schlesinger is in the business as the London tube announcements have it of minding the gap. The history of women has always figured in archives and museums, but it hasn't always been featured. My colleague Laurel Ulrich recently reminded me that not very long ago, you could walk into a major repository and ask to look at collections relevant to women and families, only to be told that there simply weren't any. Even today, women and ideas about women, gender, and sexuality remain underrepresented in the documentary record. This is partly because, over the long arc of history, women have saved men's records much more often than the reverse has proved true. Within this landscape, politically conservative women and grassroots conservative organizations focused on the household have been doubly hidden by gender and by ideology. Family values conservatism isn't by any means undocumented, but it has been and remains underdocumented relative both to progressive social movements and to conservative movements led by men and or focused on geopolitics. This is not by design on either the archival or the activist side. I think our panelists today are far from alone in thinking about the legacy of their movement work, and Schlesinger likewise has company in thinking about these issues among our peer institutions. The obstacles, I think, have stemmed from a combination of path dependency and mistrust, and I hope we can begin to remedy both of those today. The gathering could not be more timely. The death last month of Phyllis Schlafly, inarguably one of the most significant figures of the second half of the 20th century, reminds us that even the longest-lived activists eventually pass into history. We're at a generational turning point where records of the heated family values contests of the post-World War II era will either make their way into institutions or suffer the fate of most of the records of most of humanity over most of history, which is to be lost. 